worthy in as much as to call your name, even more so to worship you. Because we have in countless ways come short of your glory. We have not been faithful to your cause. We have not been obedient to your commands as we ought to. Gracious God, we demonstrate love conveniently and even in a limited way. Lord, we come today because we need you to transform us and to enable us to be the people that you would have us be. So we confess to you this time our sins, which we have committed, Lord, knowingly or unworthily. Lord, so often we excuse ourselves by saying that we are human. Yes, we are, but we also are to be spiritual beings who should rely on you for every good and perfect gift and every ability to rise above our weakness. And so, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you, gracious God, to cleanse us. We ask you, Lord, to renew us, empower us and enable us so that we may feel and experience the fullness of your forgiveness which transform us and enable us to know that you have done what no one else can do, not even ourselves. So as we confess our sins to you, gracious God, we ask you, gracious Father, to take us as we are, accept the confession that we bring to you now. And when we do so, Lord, you will indeed forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us, in a moment, confess our sins to God as we pray for his forgiveness. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful, O God, to forgive us of all our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Thanks be to God. And so, Father, we give you thanks and praise at this time. We thank you, Lord, for this midday worship experience. We thank you, Lord, that we can use this experience to better understand what you, gracious Father, has done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. What he, O oh gracious Father, willingly and deliberately yield himself to your way and that which, O oh God, you have so ascribed for him. We thank you, Lord, that he died for us. We thank you, Lord, that he rose triumphant over death and is alive and alive forevermore. We thank you, God, for the fellowship that we share even now. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the ways in which we who come before you try with the help of your Holy Spirit to truly understand who you are and what you mean to us. So, Lord, at this point, we ask you to take charge of this proceeding. We ask you, God, to take charge of each of us, and that as you take charge of us, we pray, God, that you will unite our hearts and minds together as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to your word, but above all, as we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. To John chapter 6, reading from verse 28 through to verse 35. Please stand for the reading. Glory to Glory you, to O you God. God. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God 
that you believe in him whom he was sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors at the mountain in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of Christ. Amen. Praise be to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> John chapter 6 and verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This, of course, is quite fitting, fitting to look into the theme that's uh, ascribed for today, temptation and the sub-theme, hunger. Temptation and the sub-theme, hunger. This was Jesus' response to a request by the crowd as stated in John chapter 6 verse 34. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. But perhaps we can ask ourselves this afternoon what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. Or whether that meaning holds good for today. So then we might say, what, is, what Jesus means when he said, uh, I am the bread of life. Jesus meant that bread sustains life. It is that which without life cannot go on. But what is life? Clearly, as Jesus brought it to the awareness of those to whom he, he responded and to those who made that request to him, he was saying to them, clearly life is meant something far more than mere physical existence. And therefore, we can accept the fact that life means that Jesus is not only concerned about the physical life, but Jesus is concerned about the spiritual life also. And that is why when we come to occasions like this, when we come to the season of Lent, it reminds us not just of the physical life, it reminds us of the spiritual life. And this is why very often we, we at Lent would have midweek service like this, where the spiritual aspect of our life is attended to, where the physical things are shelved partially and give way to the spiritual aspect of life. During his temptation in the wilderness, the devil said to Jesus, exalted him in a way that Jesus had to conform himself to. You see, the devil's attempt was to ensure that Jesus exalted himself to the point of proving that he is indeed the Son of God. At a time when he was deemed vulnerable, vulnerable because he was hungry, and consequently it was fitting for Jesus to prove that he is the Son of God, thereby satisfying his hunger after fa fasting for 40 days. Fasting 
my sisters and brothers, is a way of emptying oneself of physical food in order to be filled spiritually, which gives one the opportunity to pray, to meditate, and to commune with God, thereby having complete trust and reliance on God, and it brings about a state of testing and humility. So as we look at Jesus' own experience in the wilderness, we realize that the opportunity to be tempted was very evident. It was at a point in time when Jesus, after fasting, was hungry, as the scripture tells us. But what better opportunity, what greater occasion is there to hit the nail on the head in order to ensure that what was appropriate, what was relevant, what was most needed at the time could be brought to Jesus' understanding so that being in that state, being in a state of hunger, that he would be the Son of God, cause those stones to turn to bread so that his physical desire can be filled. But we know that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, he went through a period of testing. And that testing was to prepare him for greater works, following which he started his ministry in Galilee. So when we set aside time to fast, it brings us out on the other side, better ready and better prepared hmm. to undertake the tremendous duties and responsibilities that we as the children of God are charged with to carry out the work of God. And so in looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8, and verses 2 and 3. The passage says, Remember the, the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And therefore, we see here some very important features Jesus, having been tested for 40 days in the wilderness, but here it is we see that the children of Israel, that they were in the wilderness for 40 years, and it was by God's will in order to humble them, testing them to know what is in their hearts. So fasting and the duration or period in which this is done, it gives us the opportunity to present ourselves before God. Not to be distracted by what we eat or what we wear, but to commit ourselves during that period to prayer and meditation commit ourselves to the, the, a devotion that is pleasing and acceptable to God. So the children of Israel, they were in the wilderness and they were led by God in spite of being there for 40 years. God did that in order that they 
will humble themselves because they did not have the authority to do anything on their own. So perhaps fasting is a state of being hungry, hungry for a better relationship with God, hungry for a better understanding of who we are and who we are in relation to God. So it is that kind of understanding that the children of Israel, they, they were able to acquire, acquire because God had so placed them in such a situation where he understood their hearts. So fasting is not something that should be taken taken lightly. It should not be just for the sake of saying that we are doing it. It must be done deliberately and conscientiously. It must be done when at the end we will feel renewed and strengthened, having emptied ourselves of all the things that will preoccupy our minds and our being and give us the opportunity to be filled spiritually so that we can do and understand better the physical things of life and better understand our relationship with God. So, in other words, Jesus is saying to those who came to him, in other words, he's saying, do not walk for that which is temporary, but for that which will last forever. By so saying, Jesus brought to life the physical and spiritual dimensions of humility, humanity, body and soul. Jesus used that occasion, he used that opportunity to bring about a change of intention, a change of purpose as to why the crowd followed him to the other side of the sea. This is why they said to him, so give us this bread always because they having ate when Jesus performed the miracle with the five loaves and the two fish and again that physical hunger arose they followed him not because they wanted to see what he was doing in terms of miracles and signs but because they were hungry and they wanted no food they wanted more bread. And that's why Jesus said, if you eat of me, you will never be hungry. And if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. You see, they went to Jesus with ulterior motives. An ulterior motive is not being truthful. It was not factual, the reason why they went to look for him. They had false intentions. They did not go over to the other side of the sea to meet Jesus in order for him to show them what they thought that he was able to do. But they went over, as I said, so that they can be fed with the physical food. So what is this new spiritual meaning of life? Real life is the new relationship with God. That relationship of trust and obedience and love. That relationship is made possible only by Jesus Christ. That is to say, apart from Jesus, there may be existence, but not life. Therefore, if Jesus is the essential of life, he can be described as the bread of life. Existence and life. There is a difference between merely existing and having life. There's one passage that speaks about, or a theme that speaks about choosing life and live. Choosing life and live. The choice is to choose life and you will live. You see? So in keeping with this new life, in his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 4, 
25. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. And verse 31 and 32, verses 31 and 32 puts it this way. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So here it is that the, the Apostle Paul in writing to the Ephesians made these statements. This of course is so applicable in this season of Lent. In two instances the Apostle makes reference to putting away falsehood. And rather let us speak the truth. And he went on to say, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander. In other words, this occasion perhaps is one of the most fitting occasions, this season, so that we, we move merely, not merely into the question of just praying. But self-examination, this is why the Old Testament in Deuteronomy says it, that God did that to, to, to see what is in the heart, to know something about the heart. So being hungry must also be deemed to be hungry for these conditions, these ills, these evil that may be lurking and dwelling within to be removed, hungry for a better way of life, hungry for a better understanding, hungry for a better way of loving, a better way of dealing with our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues. It must be something that brings out a desire, not the desire as did those who went to Jesus on the other side of the sea to find just bread or fish that would only last for a while, but something, a desire that will last forever. And that desire is only possible through Jesus Christ. So during this season, during this season, we, we make pledges, we make promises regarding what we do or what we avoid. We, are, we, we make pledges to talk about the food we eat, we wouldn't eat much or we wouldn't eat at all. Our diet must be different. How we attire is going to be different. Where we go and how we go, all these things are done. But there is something more fundamental. And that greater and more fundamental uh, approach is to seriously let God see what is in our hearts. And when God sees our hearts, he will know truly who his people are. Yes, these things are good. Changes. Be differently. Uh, operate in a way that you don't normally do during the, the regular times. But are they really fundamental? Are they sound? Are they sufficient to bring about genuine transformation? required for the new relationship with God. I'm saying to us today, my sisters and brothers, that transformation comes through that relationship that Jesus pointed those who came with him to, that they should indeed follow him and feed on him. For those who feed on him will never be hungry, and those who drink of him will never be thirsty. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, we trust that as we have heard something of that which relating to you means and how we share a relationship with you and with each other, that our hearts may be so 
design and that we may so understand to a great extent the ways in which we can go through this period of Lent and how we'll be able to celebrate the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>